I am on the edge of my seat to hear him speak this morning, Kashif Khan. Hey guys. So I'm not sure who was here for Anna's talk that was just finished, but she said something that resonated with me that I thought I should share. She asked how many people feel like they got stuck on this keto journey and almost everybody raised their hand because we all kind of plateau. And the challenge is, how, are we do, how do we make the right choice? If you're here, you're very purposefully trying, you're, whether it's trying to get out of illness, whether it's trying to be the best version of yourself, whether it's I need more energy, I can't sleep at night, whatever that thing is, you're digging through all these offers and products trying to make the right choice for yourself. What would be the outcome if you always made the right choice? If you knew exactly what to do? And when Anna said that, it, it resonated because that's truly what we're trying to help people do. So inside each one of your 50 trillion cells that make up this miraculous human body, there's a little instruction manual. So each cell, depending on what job it does, whether it's a heart cell, a liver cell, a kidney cell, knows what section of that manual to read. And it goes and does its job. And there's all these infinite number of jobs that our body's trying to ex execute at all given times, but we do them differently. So that instruction manual, that genetic code that's in your cells is written a little off for some people and written a little bit better for some people, depending on the job. So if you start to understand how to read this manual, you start to understand what choices to make. So billions of dollars have been spent literally on decoding this human genome. It just got completed recently. And the question then becomes, well, then why is everyone still so sick? We have the biggest chronic disease budget we've ever had. We have a $4 trillion healthcare budget. 90% of that is spent on chronic disease, unfortunately. We're expected as Americans to have our first chronic disease by 50, a second one by 60, last 15 years of your life spent in treatment. That's the actual average. 50% uh, of us will have cardiovascular disease, 50% will have cancer, 60% will have a chronic disease at some point. Only 5% are metabolically healthy right now. So where did, this, where did this science go? Why are we still feeling the way we feel? Our healthcare system, the easiest way to put it, is not healthy or caring or a system. If you had to go through it, you probably know that. Uh, we have this really strong acute care model, break your arm, someone will fix it. That's the same way we deal with chronic disease, which is not the way it should be dealt with. You don't wait to get sick and try and mask it. You understand why you may get sick and then prevent it. That's what you should be doing. And by understanding your genetic code, that's possible. So the best way to paint a picture for you is, imagine I gave you a gift, a pet named Sushi, a fish in a bowl. And when I passed Sushi over to you, she was swimming in polluted water toxic, green, smoggy, polluted water. You instinctively know, you immediately know, I need to remove sushi and put her somewhere else, right? We all know that. What we do in our healthcare system is we say, well, sushi is swimming around in this smog and she's starting to get a headache, so let me give her a pill. Sushi is now banging her head against the glass and has a little bit of depression. Let me give her another pill. Sushi has a lump on her neck, which looks like cancer. Let me give her another pill. And we never ask, why did these things happen? It's very clear. Take her out of the toxins that are mutating and destroying her cells and causing all these things to, to come to life, and it wouldn't happen. So if we understand these about ourselves, these things wouldn't happen to ourselves. I'll give you some examples. Actual patients we've worked on blow your mind in terms of what's possible. So I myself was sushi, first of all. I went through crazy eczema to the point where I couldn't open my left eye psoriasis to the point where if I clasped my knuckles like this, my knuckles would bleed. Uh, migraines where I just couldn't go to work, dysfunctional. Depression, gut issues. Yes, I used a keto diet to fix part of that. But I first understood by diving into my genetic code that there were certain key genes that I didn't even have, absolutely missing. One of them was around my gut. So there's a gene called GSTM1, which is protective against toxins entering through your gut. So toxins enter primarily through you breathing them and you eating them. Yes, also through your skin, but these are the two majority of where they come from. So this gene, it's not about what version or what SNP or what variant, I, I don't even have it. It's a page torn out of my human instruction manual. So I don't do this job of when I was working downtown, going to lunches every day, entertaining clients, eating not the best food, the pesticides, chemicals, drying agents, plastics, and everything that came along with it directly went through my gut lining into my bloodstream and caused crazy inflammation because I could not block them like my business partner who was sitting right next to me that did not have my health issues. 
That was one thing. When it came to the neurochemicals of my brain, the way I process dopamine is a little unique. So dopamine is this chemical that allows you to experience pleasure or reward, right? So ultimately satisfaction. These are two paths to satisfaction. The receptors in your brain are driven by a gene called DRD2. And I have the worst version of that gene, which means it's very hard for me to experience pleasure and reward. The density of my receptors just isn't there. There's another gene called COMPT, which creates the COMPT enzyme that then clears the dopamine out to get you back to normal. And mine is super fast. So I'm feeling it way down here, and it's gone like that. So I'm wired for three things. Depression, because I just don't feel. And yes, I've been through that. Addiction, because I find the thing that gives me pleasure, and I chase and pursue it, and it becomes my whole reality because I just can't ever get that feeling without that thing. I've experienced that. Achievement because you go down the reward route, and reward also powers dopamine and satisfaction, and you make stupid, crazy decisions and take risks that other people wouldn't do because of that reward-seeking behavior. Guess what, I'm also doing that, I'm doing that right here today. Built a company out of something that I didn't even understand five years ago. So, understanding that about myself, I was driving my human capacity a little too hard and creating a burden of stress that created a burden of cortisol, that created a burden of chronic disease. The, the, the moment that we took what we have in terms of research and realized we're not a research company, everybody needs this, was something that actually happened with my niece. And I'll tell you that story today. So my niece, a couple years ago, um, my, she lives with my mother and my sister. I got a call from my mother saying that I think she's having an anxiety attack. She can't breathe. Come over here. So I went over there. And she truly was sitting there like gasping for air. I called a pediatrician friend, which is the instinct, and he said, that does sound like a classic anxiety attack. If it happens again, let me know. So sometime later, my mom and my sister called me again. They said, you need to get over here because it happened again, but this time she fell over and she hurt her leg. And it looks like she can't walk. So I called my pediatrician friend again. I said, get me into the hospital. I'm, I'm from Canada, so when you go to a hospital, it takes eight hours. It's free, but you have to wait eight hours to see somebody. So that's the, the you know, weighing the, the good and the bad. So ultimately, I did sit there with her for the day. Every blood test, every scan, there was no problems. The answer was, if it happens again, let us know. And at that point, I knew what that meant. If it happens again, we're diagnosing her with an anxiety problem, and we're going to tell you what pill she has to take. So... I thought, okay, I have her genetics. I've done it for my whole family. I'm going to understand what's really going on. But I didn't. I got busy and went back to work. A month later, my mother called me again. This time she was bawling, crying, saying, I found a note and your niece has run away from home. Now, you don't know my niece, but it's completely out of character. Sweet, innocent girl, doesn't leave the house on herself by her own choice. She's just that innocent and naive. And she ran away. So I got over there and I said, she can't have gone far. It's out of character for her, so we'll figure this out. And I got there. She was literally down the street, just standing there, not knowing what to do. I asked her, what are you running away from? And she didn't know. I, I thought, like, is it a boy thing, social media, bullying? Like, what's going on? She truly didn't know. She was running away from that space, that feeling. She didn't know what to do. That's when I literally, at that point, went into my email, opened up her genetic report, not to look for anxiety, just to look for red flags. What jobs was her body not doing well that could then equal this? Because it's genetics plus epigenetics. What is my environment? What is my nutrition? What is my lifestyle? Then it equals a net result. And you have to understand both. And I clued in at that time. Wait a second. My mother and my sister have been calling me like clockwork monthly. So I texted my mom saying, tell me about her menstrual cycle. She was 13 at the time. And she said, you know what? Now that you say that, this happened right at the beginning of the cycle. Every time. And it was happening like clockwork every month. So I looked at her hormones in her genetics, and the way she makes them is highly inefficient. So the circadian rhythm of the menstrual cycle is like this. It's up and down. The beginning of the cycle is when you have the least hormones. They're non-existent. She's highly androgen dominant. She makes a lot more testosterone, a lot less estrogen. So her delta value is way deeper. She goes into a deeper decline of zero hormones, right? So that was one. But then why did it happen now? She was in her cycle for some time. Why now? This happened during peak COVID two years ago in Toronto in the winter when we had one of the worst lockdowns on this planet. One of the longest lockdowns was in Toronto. 
And in a Toronto winter where she hadn't gone outside in four or five months and got zero vitamin D, which you just heard from Anna is so important, right? So I looked up the genetics of her vitamin D. It has the most complex micronutrient um, meta metabolic pathway of all the... Usually there's one gene that takes a thing, puts it in your body, and you can use it. Vitamin D has three. You first need to take D2 from the sun, convert it into D3. There's a gene that does that. You then need to transport it to the cell where you actually use it. There's a gene that does that. You then need to bind it at the cell and actually get it into the system and use it. There's a gene that does that. Our ancestors used to overdose on sun and vitamin D. So they have the ability to mitigate and we still have that trait that we no longer need. All three of these, these genes for her were suboptimal. She didn't do any of these jobs well. And she hadn't been outside in four months. We already heard, again, how impactful vitamin D is on your hormones. So then why did it equal an anxiety problem? Well, like her crazy uncle, she inherited the genetics of slim to none dopamine. So she's already teetering on the borderline of the world sucks. Nothing feels good, right? So because of her epigenetic environment, what she was doing at the time, the load then put on her genetic capacity or incapacity to deal with that epigenetic load led to what looked like anxiety. What was it? Hormones are off, no vitamin D, and it triggered a, a mood and behavior response because she was already teetering on the edge. So what would have been a prescription and an anxiety pill turned into, I gave her 10,000 IU of vitamin D, but I split the dose because she didn't transport and bind it. So I gave her 5,000 in the morning, 5,000 midday, so that she could actually use, utilize it efficiently. I gave her L-theanine to boost her dopamine levels, and that was it. That was literally it. Since that day, she has never had this problem again. It's been two years. She would have probably still been on a pill today. So now there's many, many, many stories like this. We've done this thousands of times for you name, whether it's autism, breast cancer, any example of a chronic disease or something that you don't innately have that you're not born with, you shouldn't ever have. The pace at which you age, you should be able to control. And I'll use breast cancer as an example just because genetically I know it's spoken of, the, the BRCA gene. Is anyone here familiar with the BRCA gene? Yeah? So you hear about it, and it's a scary four-letter word for women. And in fact, CNN just put out a story about a month ago saying that if you have this version of the, the BRCA gene, you should cut your fallopian tubes out to prevent ovarian cancer. That's the suggestion. Cut your breasts off and cut your fallopian tubes out. So, what's actually going on? The BRCA gene doesn't cause cancer. And this is the difference between genetics, what we knew, and functional genomics, what we now know. The same difference between medicine. Medicine is go do whatever you want, and when you break yourself, the doctor is supposed to fix you. Right? Functional medicine is let's figure out why you got sick and teach you the right habits so you never get sick again, and we reverse this problem. The why, which is the most important part. So, genetics is BRCA go cut your breasts off because I see risk. Functional genomics is BRCA doesn't cause cancer. It's a tumor suppressor. If you have cancer in your body, BRCA is the job that gets rid of it. It's constantly fighting cancer. So if you have a bad version, you don't do a good job of repair. So a greater likelihood of, God forbid, dying from cancer, right? What actually causes it? There's many causes. I can give you one of the big ones. Some women in their hormone cascade, and there's three steps here, make a lot more estrogen, the opposite of my niece. They're estrogen dominant. This is very easy to determine genetically because the genes that drive each step are clear. Step two, some women in that estrogen dominance, before you have that monthly cycle, or if you're menopausal, you're, you're still doing this, you're just not clearing it, make a metabolite, either two, four, or 16 hydroxy estrogen, as they're called. Two is the good, clean stuff you want. Four and 16 are toxic. The genes that drive this are very clear, and we can determine what you make. Step three, if you do make too much estrogen, and if you do make the toxic version, so you're now fueling the fire, how well do you clear it? There's certain detox uh, jobs in your body, glutathione, glucuronidation, antioxidation, that come along and clean this stuff up. You may not be doing a good job there. So now all of a sudden you have this profile of somebody who makes too much estrogen, they make a bad version, a toxic version, they don't get rid of it. Even then it doesn't yet equal breast cancer. What equals breast cancer? Well, like so many North American women, birth control pill for 5, 10, 15 years, fielding that estrogen fire. Like so many North American women, not understanding hormone disruptors, your frying pan, your chemicals, your pesticides, your plastics, all mimicking hormones as they enter your body. Again, the epigenetic load creating more of what you were now dealing with. 
uh, women getting onto hormone replacement therapy as they age, not understanding where specifically to intervene, just filling the top of the funnel, not knowing they should have started here because of the way their genes uh, metabolize their hormones. And all of a sudden you have this profile that has risk and you've overloaded it. Now you get into menopause, which is when most breast cancer happens. And you no longer have a menstrual cycle to get rid of that toxic monthly low that you create. And your body intelligently says, I don't want my organs and my vasculature and my veins to get damaged and inflamed. So I'm going to get rid of this stuff. But I don't have a cycle, so I'm going to go store it in fat. Keep it away from everything. And where do women have fat? Hips and breasts, right? And your breasts are full of all these glands and ducts that were never designed as a cellular structure to cope with that level of inflammation. And all of a sudden, cellular degradation, mutation, cancerous tissue develops, right? So that's your why. And this is when BRCA is actually supposed to start working. Now BRCA gets to work. So the question of do you have this and should you cut something off versus I can test a five-year-old girl and tell you here's your hormone cascade, here's the exact choices you should make to be healthy, here's the exact choices that if you were to make them, you would end up with breast cancer. It's that clear. And this is one why, there's many whys. Uh, but this applies again to diet. Why are we here today? We're talking about keto, right? And a lot of you have either tried it or are planning to try it. You may be curious, maybe you're a veteran and on the topic. But all these jobs, including how you metabolize macro and micronutrients, are determined by the genes that do the jobs. And there's, myself included, people that don't metabolize fat so well. And so if you do go on a keto diet, and it's, it's good for everybody therapeutically, but for the people that do get stuck, that very first thing that we said here today when I started, why did you get stuck? Well, there's some people that can maybe cycle on and off, use it as a, as a therapeutic tool, and it does heal. It's truly healing. But should you just sustain it ongoing, or do you break and switch it up? There's some people that are highly efficiently use fat as fuel, and they should just keep doing it. That's what they're designed to do. There's some people that don't make the enzymes to break down chickpeas, lentils, legumes, and they go on a vegan diet and they feel horrible. You know, there's some people that have the best possible insulin response and they're sitting there with their family and they're cooking dinner and they feel great, but their kids can't get their homework done because they're carb crashing and it's, they're told that they have ADHD when all that's happening is they don't have a genetic ability to cope with insulin properly. So all these things are in this human instruction manual and it can be read properly. I'll tell you one more thought about an athlete we were dealing with. Um, so in Toronto, where we are based, it's, it's the hub, the mecca of NHL training. We have the best trainers there, I'll say it openly. And a lot of the players come up there in off-season to train. And there was a gentleman we were dealing with that uh, came to us saying that he can't recover. Um, and so we looked at his genetics, and that was the thing that he asked us about, but we found many other things we needed to fix. So we looked at his sleep. And one of the things that made him such a great player is also what caused him to not be able to sleep. And so the context also drives the outcome. The context of his mood and behavior are neurochemicals. So serotonin is this happy chemical. We know of it as like an anxiety, depression chemical if you have the wrong levels, uh, and it's very good if you have the right levels. The function and, and how it, the, the mechanism of how it does that, it allows your brain to prioritize stimulus. Whatever's going on, whether you're listening to me, you're, you know, somebody's walking by, there's a smell, what should I be focused on? Serotonin kind of does that. And based on the irritability or lack thereof caused by that stimulus, you're either happy or you're irritated and bothered. And so it affects your mood. So this gentleman was dysregulated for serotonin, meaning the receptors are a little short. He couldn't manage and have the right levels given on, uh, based on whatever was going on. He wasn't responding appropriately. It made him an amazing hockey player because he was hypersensitive to stimulus. Every little nuance of every little move he could feel in every finger. He could see what was going on in every direction and paid attention to everything. It's, it's kind of like hy not hyperattention deficit. It's just hyperattention. He sees everything, right? Now, put this in the context of sleep, what made him a great hockey player and why he couldn't recover. He didn't have a recovery problem. He had a sleep problem, which he didn't realize. Melatonin, as we know, is the hormone that puts us to sleep. So ancestrally, 
our ancestors used to see the amber glow of fire every night, and that would trigger the binding of melatonin. We still need that. We don't get it. Instead, we're on blue lights like this and getting the opposite. But really, that's what used to happen. Melatonin gets bound, puts you to sleep. Serotonin is the neurochemical and hormone that wakes you up. And what's supposed to happen is the amber glow of sunlight, which is actually more of a peachy glow, goes through your eyelid and triggers, let's bind some serotonin and get out of bed. I'm truly awake now. That first half of sleep is recovery. Let's get rid of all the toxins and repair the muscle tissue from the day before. Second half is let's get, re let's get ready for the next day. I'm going to make my hormones, make my neurochemicals, prepare for the next day. So this is when you're making your serotonin in your gut. So his serotonin was dysregulated, which meant he can prioritize stimulus, which meant in that second half, half of night when his brain was trying to wait for the signal of sunlight to wake up, every single stimulus disrupted his sleep. Hubby's foot is too cold. Somebody tugged on, tugged on the blanket. A dog barked two blocks down the street. Uh, it's too hot. He's overheating. The things that some people can sleep through kept triggering him to wake up because his brain thinks, time to wake up? No, go back to sleep. Time to wake up? No, go back. back. And that's why he couldn't recover. It, it was a sleep issue. And so what we did was we managed the serotonin levels through simple supplementation, but we also environmentally built him a sleep cocoon. Cooling pad, weighted blanket, blackout blinds, eye mask. There's some good products out here for that type of thing. Uh, turned off the blue screens at the right time. So it, the, the genetic code will tell you, again, here's the job your body does well. Here's the job my body does not so well. Here's the context I'm now in. Here's the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm going to go back to that instruction manual and I'm going to figure out how that applies to this context. Because the same thing that made, was highly beneficial in his sport was highly detrimental in his sleep. So in this context, I'm now going to figure out how it applies. Step three is I'm now going to understand environment, nutrition, and lifestyle choices that apply to that problem in that context. And I can always make the right choice. The very first thing we said. And now imagine what is the outcome of always making the right choice? I don't have to have chronic diseases. I can age a lot slower. I can have optimal energy and optimal performance. My mood will be as it should be all the time. I can sleep amazing. I won't be like every other woman saying, I have endometriosis, PCOS, infertility issues, acne, hair loss, what's going on with this crazy menopause? All that gray area, and one thing I'll say straightforward, in our research, we spent three years studying 7,000 people. That's how we came up with these insights that are, here's the genes, here's the problem, here's the choices that people have to make. The biggest problem we saw was female hormone health. So underserved, this thing that is so black and white at the genetic level, is being reinterpreted as gray. And women come into clinics and are told, yeah, you're supposed to have problems, it's your hormones. That's why we're here, right? To tell you what this thing is called and what pill to take or what surgery to get. When ultimately, a young woman who I was talking to outside yesterday, who happened to have our DNA test done, who has had endometriosis for a long time and is now flaring up with extreme gut pain and is being told she needs surgery, literally yesterday in this hall, opened up her report and what did I see? that she is really efficient at converting progesterone into testosterone, so she makes too many hormones to begin with. She is hyper-efficient at converting that testosterone into estrogen, so she's highly estrogen dominant. She has the fastest possible metabolic pathway to convert that estrogen into the 4-hydroxy, one of the toxic versions, right? She is designed for hormone imbalance if you put her in the context of North American life with all the hormone disruption and hormone mimicking. So she doesn't need surgery. She doesn't, she doesn't need medication. What she needs is to block that estrogen conversion. And we already know what supplements do that. What she needs is to support the clearance of the toxicity. We already know what supplements do that. So with simple supplements, she could resolve what was going to lead to a surgery. And this area, again, I would say is the most highly underserved, uh, is that female hormone health area. And what needs the most support, and it's the easiest to fix because it's so black and white. So again, ask yourself a question. And by the way, a uh, number of you had asked about Q&A time, so I was going to leave some time for that. Uh, but goes back to the same thing. Whatever we're doing, whether it's diet, sleep, exercise, performance, we are constantly making choices. We constantly have to decide, what did this influencer say? What did this podcaster say? This sounds amazing, but they probably spent five years struggling 
on all these different choices before they found that thing that was so amazing that made them so motivated to scream for the rooftops how well it works and teach you about it. Don't go through all that trial and error is what we're saying. The human genome has been decoded now. We understand what it's saying and it's saying something different for each one of us. So understand what your body is saying at the cellular level and you can make the right choice every single time. So with that, again, prior to, some people had asked if there would be Q&A. So we're going to open it up. There's a mic right there. If anyone has any questions, you're welcome to jump up. Hello. Hey. Um, I talked to you yesterday briefly, but yes. um, so I did order the DNA test. So when it comes back, is there somebody that I'm going to be able to talk to to go through all that stuff and kind of guide so, me through all that? Yeah, so there's two, two things there. We, so me personally, when I went through my health journey, I found that genetics was broken. Right? It's, too, it's a different language that even the clinicians didn't understand. And unless you were a PhD, it was hard to draw much out of it. And so we tried to make it easy. The report isn't, here's this gene, now go figure it out. It's not 80% dense of Alzheimer's, good luck. It's like anxiety. How is that happening to you? Why is that happening to you? Here's what to do about it. So that's one answer. The second answer is even then, we realize that we need to give more to make this actionable to make it impactful for you. So as of May 1st, we're launching a live Q&A webinar series where anyone like yourself that has a test can attend a hormone session, a sleep session, a diet session, um, and so on and so on and so on to live Q&A with myself and some of our clinicians. Just ask whatever you need to ask for your personal issue because everybody's problems are different. We can't possibly report on every single problem. So that webinar series is going to help you a lot. You'll be able to dive into whatever you're going with. And, and the things that you didn't even know are wrong. So based on your genetics, you're going to hear things that you didn't even know you needed to know uh, that may help you prevent things in the future. Yeah, I think it's super beneficial because like I was telling you yesterday, I don't <clears throat> know my biological father, so I don't know the paternal side. So this will maybe answer some questions that I don't even know to ask. So that's good. Yeah, for sure. So awesome. Thanks. No, no problem. Hi, thanks for being here. I'm, my name is Vicki, and I'm one of your clients also. Um, but I've had trouble getting my report. So are you going to be available after this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come to the booth. Come to the booth. So the report is it's issued through a portal. You have to log in, and it's, it kind of looks like Netflix. You're drilling into tiles as opposed to like a paper report. So come to the booth, and we'll connect you to the portal and set okay, it up. That would be great. I'd appreciate yeah. that. No Thanks problem. Thanks for what you're doing. This is a great idea. No, Especially thank you. for those of us who do have chronic issues. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name's Brian. My name's Brian. Um, I got a report a couple months ago. I, I got a, also an email about you have a book coming out. That's, yeah, correct. I, could, you, could you talk about that a little bit and what, how that would help in addition to if you've already had the report and done? Sure. Kind of stuff? So the book is a story in itself. <laughs> the book was... Uh, us trying to ask the question, we have this tool, so Vicky comes up and says, thank you, this is like, I needed this, right? Nobody knows they need this. Genetics has been 80% chance of Alzheimer's, 60% chance of breast cancer, good luck, and be on your way. And nobody wants to even know that information. I'd rather not know it's c coming, right? But if I can tell you, yes, but here's exactly what you do about it, that's powerful. Now I know where to prioritize. Here's my problem. Here's what I do to never have that problem, right? So what we believe we needed to do was normalize this. Like people need to know this is part of your toolkit. And so we figured the best way to do that is to write a book. And so I worked with an agent who represents 80 medical doctors and got rec uh, rejected by every single publisher in this country because they said, you're not a doctor. What do you know? Right? I said, the whole point of my existence is to take what the doctors don't know and to teach it back to them. And I now do that. I speak at medical conferences all the time, right? And so I went back and looked at the list of everyone that rejected us and said, this company looks great because of who their other authors are. So I called them and in one phone call, they said, you know what, we need to do this book. And within three days, they had sent us a contract and the book is now coming out. So what is the book? Uh, it's literally me telling my story on how I use the genome as a layman. I didn't know this science a few years ago 
to heal all of my chronic conditions, five of them at the same time, reversed my biological age by 10 years, tested cardiovascularly, methylation. So there's meth methylation is an epigenetic expression, which will speak to how old you are on the inside. And this wasn't an intention, it was more just a byproduct. By testing, I learned that I truly reversed my age by 10 years. So anyways, it's, it's me diving into how to make this easy. Right? It, whether you have a test or not, there's a lot to learn in terms of how to make it easy. It's called the DNA way and it's coming out next month. Hi. Hey. Big fan and I just sent in my sample so I'm waiting Amazing. on my report and my husband's a physician so he started a practitioner account. And I'm curious if you have actual practitioner trainings. We do, yeah. Okay. So we, we believe, so even the way we think about training is very different, right? So it's, we don't think you need to know the deep science. We think you need to know that tip of the iceberg, the insights, right? Which is, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? And I don't need to know what a chromosome looks like, right? I need to know how I fix breast cancer. How do I use this as a tool? So that's what our training looks like. Yeah, like how to tell our clients or our patients how to take action. Yes, yeah. the actionable insights. So Jason at our booth leads that effort. So we're building now a curriculum for CE credits, but until that's done, uh, it's, it is live, it's available. Jason is managing that. Excellent. Yeah. So any other thoughts or questions? No? If not, I'm going to tell you one more story. There's a gentleman here that has a question, then after that I'll... Oh, no. Okay. So I'm going to tell you one more thing. Um, we were dealing with um, a family, and I, I bring this up because I was speaking to a gentleman yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of... So what we talked about so far is how do I fix my problems? There's a lot of people that are sort of misdiagnosed for their problems, and your genome will help you understand that. So we were dealing with a family where uh, the mother was diagnosed with Lyme disease. We participated in the largest, I believe it's the largest Lyme study in North America. It happened in Toronto. Lyme is an epidemic in Canada. It's very quietly happening. Nobody talks about it, but it's a massive problem. Uh, and we, we did a study where we worked on 800 uh, Lyme patients with their genome in hand to understand why does this person not even know they have it? This person feels kind of like a flu and this person can't get out of bed for six months. It's the same bug with the same bacteria in the, entering the same species. Why this disparity and variability in outcome? Of course, there's probably something genetic going on there in terms of how we cope with that. So we learned firstly is that 30% of the women in the study who were diagnosed with Lyme on medication didn't even have it. What they had was estrogen toxicity, the thing we talked about for breast cancer, right? Which mimics the exact same symptoms, but because estrogen toxicity isn't part of, you know, the medical protocol and go to primary care and, hey, this is something I should look at, nobody looks for it. It's not something that's being tested for or spoken of. Uh, and so 30% of the women were eliminated, didn't even have Lyme, right? Now that variable outcome, uh, when you look at genetics, one of the big genes that people talk about is MTHFR, methylation. And methylation is much more than just MTHFR, it's a full cascade. So it's how does your body deal with inflammation and how does your body deal with gene expression? So your genes are constantly reacting to the environment. So here's your base code. Here's my instruction manual. Now, based on my level of stress, what I ate, the lighting conditions, my genes are constantly responding and either slowing down or speeding up to allow me to manage those inputs. Inflammation is one of those outcomes. How well does your body deal with inflammation? So methylation is what turns those dials. Most of us don't methylate that well. I can tell you that based on our research. It's a big problem and the solution is so easy. So this family we're dealing with Mother was uh, suffering from Lyme disease, misdiagnosed, didn't have it. And what we found was we went back and they had done a renovation and broken up the kitchen and replaced it. And we went in and tested the home and there was mold everywhere, right? Mold spores. Why only mom? Because mom didn't methylate properly and all the kids inherited dad's methylation genes that were superhuman methylation. Right? So her ability to cope with this airborne threat, this inhalation-based threat, was horrible. They detoxified well, the kids and the dad, so they cleared it well. There's a process called glucuronidation that clears some hormones, but it also clears mold. Dad did it well, kids did it well. Mom didn't do it well, also didn't deal with inflammation well. So the support 
that was needed wasn't medication or drugs or pills. It was B12 and folinic acid. Two supplements. And not folate, not folic acid, because her specific, there's a gene called SHMT1 which determines do I use folic acid or do I use folinic acid? Same job, same process, but what ingredient do I need? Even the B12 she needed was very specific. There's genes called MTR, MTR, and, and FUT2 that sort of drive that B12 pathway. And some people need what's called adenosyls. When you go buy B12 at a store, it's usually methylcobalamin. That's the standard, right? Some of us don't metabolize that well because our ancestors didn't eat beef. It's as simple as that. So your ability to then take it into the gut and utilize it, you don't genetically have. And a lot of us are in that bucket. So you need what's called an adenosyl and you need to take it sublingually under your tongue. This was the solution for her. We gave her a B12 that was sublingual under the tongue, adenosyl and folinic acid. And all of a sudden she didn't have what she thought was Lyme disease anymore, diagnosed and prescribed pills for her. She also was able to cope with the mold intolerance. There's obviously the acute response of dealing with the mold in the home, but she was now on par with her family in terms of her biological function because we upregulated the jobs that weren't happening properly in her body. They just needed the right ingredients added, epigenetics plus genetics. There's a lady we dealt with in Toronto who came to a clinic and she was in a car accident, could not feel her arm, completely numb. She was elderly, by the way, from her elbow to her fingertip. And she was told by her clinicians, this is damage. You're in a car accident. You have nerve damage. This is done. You know, you can, it's there, but it doesn't work. That was her new reality. She came in, got genetic testing through a third-party clinic. Uh, she went on to a supplement protocol, not for the purpose of this. She just wanted to feel better. She asked her clinic, what are the best supplements that we can take? She said, do this test. It will tell you, right? Two weeks into it, she woke up with pain in her fingers. And she called the clinician who then called us saying she's having an adverse reaction to this thing. And, and my, my question was, didn't you say it was numb? I would think feeling is not an adverse reaction. That's the benefit because now all of a sudden things are working. She's like, yeah, you're right. Okay, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. So six weeks into it, she had full function from fingertip to elbow again after two years. So what happened? Just like mom with poor methylation who was suffering from Lyme disease that actually had a mold intolerance, she also didn't methylate well. So what was she suffering from? Neural inflammation that she couldn't fight. And at her age, as you age, things are more difficult. It was just still inflamed. It wasn't numb or dead or damaged. It was inflamed. Her neurology was choked and she wasn't able to feel anything in this location where she had the impact, right? So simply supporting methylation and driving that process at a hyper level, all of a sudden feeling came back to this thing that medically was done, right? So going back to the very first thing I said, <laughs> We have to constantly make choices. We have to constantly, every day, what, every time you decide to eat something, you're either eating towards health or pain, right? You're either driving forward or backwards. Every time you choose anything in your health and wellness, it's either good or bad. It's a little step forward, a little step back. So what we've learned from studying these 7,000 people is you can always make the right choice. You can understand every little job that's happening in your body, every little biological function, how does it work? And if I know how it works, I know what's the right choice for me, not the influencer I heard on some podcast, which maybe potentially could be right, but often is not. So going back to the very first thing, if you felt like you've ever been stuck, which is what Anna Kabeka asked you and almost everybody raised their hand, you don't have to be. The answers are already in you. They're in your cells, in your, DNA code, in your genetic code, and you just need to learn how to read it. So with that, I thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, any more questions? We're right outside here to help. Thank you again.